Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen in to this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it's a blessing to you. morning. You guys are awesome. I love seeing your smiling and beautiful faces this morning. Those that aren't smiling, I love you too. And I'm going to work on your smile as much as I possibly can. They're contagious and I smile a lot. So there's a good chance that will happen. We are in a series called Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. But the series is called Anno Domini, the man who split history. Because when Jesus comes on the scene, Everything changes. And so when Jesus steps into the history of mankind, we have our calendars changed. That's what AD is on the calendar, is Anno Domini. Some of you thought it was after death. It's not. It's the year of our Lord. That even the way that we view all of time now is in view of who Christ Jesus is. What was before him, what was since his, the year of his birth, his coming to the world, that, that the creator of the universe came to be among creation in the God-man Jesus Christ. And so we're only a few weeks into this. I can give you a short recap that we saw the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, that Matthew, the writer of this, one of the disciples wants us to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment that everyone was looking for. He's the king of Israel that everyone had hoped for. He's the one that would bless all nations through the line of Abraham. It's Jesus. And the end of the genealogy, it, said, it introduces us to a man named Joseph, who is the husband, not the father of Jesus, but the husband of Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Christ the anointed one. Last week we looked at Jesus' birth and how it came about as Joseph and Mary were pledged to be married, that they were legally bound to be married, and that Mary um, was found to be pregnant. And uh, in a dream, Joseph realizes that he should stick around, that he shouldn't put Mary out, but God reveals to him that this is a special thing, that you get to be the, the, the foster dad of the savior of your people and all people that would put their faith in him. And so we, we ended with, with kind of Jesus being born. And so we'll pick up today where we left off. If you have a Bible, you can go to Matthew chapter two. We're just gonna, what we're gonna do is read the first 12 verses of chapter two. We're gonna break them down and I believe there's some things that we can learn from them and pull from them this morning. Oh, if you're taking notes, I probably should tell you the name of the message. <laughs> the Magi and the Messiah. Magi. We don't use that word often. We will today. We'll explain it in just a minute. Let's read it first. Chapter 2, verse 1. There it is. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. 
And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Okay. I get that this will feel a little bit like Christmas again today. I know that. I almost even called this um, (laughs) the ruining of the nativity scene. Because what we're going to see is that many of you have a nativity scene that isn't accurate. You have wise men in a manger. They never made it to the manger. They didn't. They showed up later. We see that today in the text. And I think there's actually a lot we're going to learn from the text today on how we recognize who Christ is and how we respond based on who he is. And so let's uh, go back through these verses a lot slower and unpack a little bit about what we're dealing with this morning in Matthew 2. Um, And just forgive me that it's not December yet when we're talking about this story. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The reason Jesus was born in Bethlehem is because a census was taken by the emperor of Rome, Caesar Augustus. He's, he, he has this census taken. Everyone goes back to their land of origin, where they're from, where their people are from. And because Joseph was from the line of David, he goes to Bethlehem, which is the city of David. So when he's there in Judea, during the time of King Herod, King Herod, let's talk about him for a minute. King Herod was known as the king of the Jews, not because he was Jewish or because they had appointed him king. Rome had appointed him king over Israel to be the king of the Jews. It was by title, not by birth, not by lineage, not by genealogy, not because his own people voted him to be king, But Rome needed someone in power over the people that they had conquered in Israel. And so they put Herod in place. Herod the Great. Herod wasn't so great. There were things he did great. He he, uh, was a master builder or he was good at making sure things were built. And so he reestablished the building of the temple, which is pretty cool. He built cities. He built theaters. And so as far as infrastructure and structures themselves, Herod was great. If you lived under his rule and reign, the things around you started getting better. But Herod was ruthless. Ruthless. A tyrant. He had his wife killed. He had several of his sons killed. He had anyone that looked like they might rise up in leadership and come against him at all murdered because he was afraid of losing the position that he was given. He liked being king. Seems like a fun position. You say something, people do that thing, even if it means killing your own family. And so Herod, although he was good at at building things, he was wicked in his heart, even to killing his own family and those That would come against him. And he had, by title, he was the king of the Jews, but he was not the king of the Jews. During the time of King Herod, Magi, and your Bible might say wise men. Magi is a term for wise men. Um, An interesting thing we're going to see today is that most stories we know are, you know, we three kings. We've heard of the three wise men. Uh, Nothing in scripture tells us there was three of them. That was just guessed because there was three gifts, three types of gifts that were given to uh, the child Jesus. And so again, I hate to ruin your nativity scene, but I don't hate to, it's kind of fun. (laughs) So the Magi, you need to understand, Magi is where we get the word magic from, magician. And and in those times, Magi can mean a lot of things. is it pertains to astrology, astronomy, sometimes sorcerers kind of bunched in this group, wise men. And in fact, Daniel, I don't know if you ever read about Daniel in the Old Testament when God's people were exiled and taken to Babylon. Daniel was the, the wisest among the wise men. 
And so when it's time to interpret dreams of the kings uh, or, or the king at the time, they gather all these wise men. They can't answer it. And, and the king at that time says, let's destroy the wise men. The wise men, it was kind of a, a catch-all term on some level. Sometimes they were wicked and practiced dark things. Sometimes they were brilliant and they could figure out puzzles and interpret things for other people. Often it was a mix of both. Hmm. You just having fun? So Jesus, born in Bethlehem, Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east, they don't know where in the east, but probably um, like maybe Babylon, that direction, came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? It's an interesting question coming to the man who has the title, the King of the Jews. And that knows he wasn't born the king of the Jews. He was appointed by foreign rulers. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So these magi from the east, there's nothing in here to say that they were actually Israelites. In fact, it believed that they wouldn't be. Maybe they would have learned about the coming of the Messiah from those that had been exiled previously. But we don't know exactly how they knew. We don't. It could have been from a dream or a vision or God sending a messenger, or it could have been from understanding that, that was given to them, passed on from the times when, when men like Daniel were taken east of Jerusalem. And so they come, and they're specifically looking for the king of the Jews. They're looking for the Messiah that would come. We saw his star, his star, as it rose. Again, these guys are astronomers, astrologers. Like, they, they deal in these things. We'll talk more about the star in a little bit. But they seem to know that something has happened and that the king of the Jews is there because they've, they've seen something in the sky. Uh, a star in the sky has turned them on to think, this is the time where we look for the one that's to come be this amazing ruler of Israel. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed or in turmoil or terrified and all Jerusalem with him. Again, we don't know why he's disturbed, but we can guess based off of who he is. He's a wicked man that loves to have control. He loves things done as he wants them done. He hates anyone that would come against him. So when you show up to his place, where he rules from, and you ask him, hey, where's the one that's been born that should be on the throne that you're sitting on now? The one that you shouldn't have, the, the one that's supposed to be there, he's got a problem with that even though they're talking about a baby. He's disturbed, and it says that all of Jerusalem is disturbed with him. And so we don't know why they're all disturbed. It could have been several things. One, we'll see later that these, these uh, magi are probably of high standing and status. They bring valuable gifts. They probably wouldn't have run by themselves. It was probably an entourage. We don't know how many of them there were. So a group of people with lots of things and probably servants and soldiers show up yeah. into where you rule and they say like, hey, we came to find the one that takes over for you. That could mess you up a little bit. Also, Jerusalem might have been scared because when people come against King Herod, it doesn't go well. And so who knows how he w might respond to, to some sort of rebellion. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. This is cool, too. You can see, again, that he's a, he's a, a counterfeit king. He's, he's a foreign king. It doesn't say when he called together the, the chief priests and teachers of the law. It says the people's. He's not one that ascribed to the same belief system. And so it, he called together all the people's chief priests, those in religious leadership, and teachers of the law, the scribes that knew the text, knew the Old Testament better than anyone. 
the religious elite. And he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. This is really cool. Because the Magi asked, where's the king of the Jews? And he understood that the king of the Jews was not just somebody that would come rule, but it's the Messiah that they were looking for, the one that would save God's people. Now, he didn't understand the depth of salvation. They mostly thought about it in terms of the state or the nation having a strong ruler that would free them from oppression from foreign countries and rulers. But he understands here that the king of the Jews is the Messiah, who they're actually looking for is the one we've all been waiting for. And you'd think that would bring excitement. Instead, he's disturbed, terrified, and turmoil. They answer, in Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And this is in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and a little jump into verse 4, I believe. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. This is great. Out of you will come a ruler that will shepherd. I love that the word shepherd's in there. Even explained here. Because when they looked for a king, again, most of them were looking for this political military king. This says he'll rule, but he'll shepherd. And shepherds take care of sheep. They protect them, but they also feed them and care for them as their own. And so he, they point to this prophecy of where the Messiah would be born. And Jesus is already born. Then Herod called the Magi or the wise men secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. If we didn't have some context for this, this would seem like a great statement. Like if we didn't know the wickedness of King Herod, and if we, didn't, if we couldn't read ahead in Scripture and see that he wanted to know how, when the star showed up, because he wanted to know how old the Messiah would be, and he wanted to know the location of that child so that he could have that child murdered like he had his own sons murdered, because he wanted to remain king and didn't like the idea of someone else coming to sit in his rightful spot on the throne. It seems like a good statement outside of that. Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, he wants them to just go, figure out where he's at, come back, let me know so that I can go there and worship. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. There's, there's some speculation about this star. There is. What do you mean the star? The star. His star. That showed up. Just showed up? Some have thought that these guys somehow had figured out that when the, the stars were in a certain place, the Messiah would be born based off of timing and history. Some have, had to sh have tried to say that it was some sort of comet they were following. Comets don't stop over houses. <laughs> also, once they get to Jerusalem, it seems as though they don't have the star to follow anymore because they ask where, where, it would, where it would go, or they, they wait to hear, where's this king of the Jews? And then once they're sent to Bethlehem, it says the star was before them again. It went ahead of them, and it stopped over the house. Comets and stars don't tend to give directions in that kind of way. Yes, they give direction. We know that. We, we know that it, sailors can tell where they're at based off the stars. But they don't stop over where you're headed and wait for you. <laughs> they continue to, as, as the world turns. 
to move in the sky. Many believe, and I think it may make the most sense, that, it, that it's a divine work of God. That it, it's like the fire and pillar of smoke in the Old Testament that would go before the people. And that the glory of God showed up so these people would have a, a, a way to find the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And so there's this star that they follow, and it stops over a house. Hmm. On coming to the house, this is another reason we know that this is later on. It's, this isn't in the manger. We don't know exactly how old Jesus was at this time. We know how old he isn't. <laughs> he wasn't just born, and he's not two. He's somewhere in between there because we'll find out later that um, King Herod would have all the boys in Bethlehem under two years old killed to try to erase the Messiah. And so he's, he's young still. He's a child. He's small. He's little, but he's not just born. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. This little kid. I don't know how little. I don't know if he's crawling yet, walking. That's got to be an interesting thing. When these men of status show up, and, and most scholars think they probably had some people with them. They've got expensive gifts with them that you bring to, to give, show homage and respect and and, and they come in your house, and they, they, bat, they find the little kid? <laughs> okay. I've got little kids. <laughs> Even having them sit down long enough to, to be able to do that would be difficult. <laughs> but Jesus is really little, and he's the Savior. So apparently, they come in, and they bow down before this little child because they understand there's something special. It's not because they're forced to. <coughs> Jesus doesn't have guards there that are like, bow to the king. <laughs> it's out of a recognition. They recognize who is before them. And they respond by worshiping him, by bowing down on their face. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's pretty cool to get as a little baby. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This is kind of cool. Some, some people have uh, associated that with who Jesus is, why they brought these gifts. I don't know that we can do that because um, the Bible doesn't tell us clearly that we can do that. Uh, but, but some, what they, they have done is just said, like, what's kind of cool, what you can see in this is, is gold oftentimes is for royalty. Frankincense is a, uh, used oftentimes in the worship of God. And that myrrh showed his humanity. And there's, it shows he's the king and that these deity and his humanity, even in the gifts, which is pretty cool. We'll find out next week they have to go on a journey, and so this would have also supplied, been able to be, be used to supply for their needs as they go on the run. But we're not there yet, so let me rewind. So they open the treasures, present to him these, these valuable gifts to honor the king of the Jews, to honor the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. And then having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Warned in a dream not to go back, again, probably connects to what Herod's going to do soon. Once he has that information, why, is he, why are they any good to him? He probably wouldn't want that information to spread. So the odds are he would kill them before he goes to try to kill the Messiah. 
So this is what I want us to do today. Now that we've uh, kind of worked through an understanding of what's going on here in the text, um, I want us to look at, and if you're taking notes, right, recognize and respond. I want us to look at the three types of people in this story and how they respond to what they recognize as the king showing up. And I want us to see how we can have a tendency to respond like one of the three. And so the main three we're going to look at is how does the King Herod respond? How do the religious elite respond? And how do the wise men, the magi, respond to an understanding that the Messiah is on the scene? Because I think we have a tendency to respond like one of them when we recognize that we need to be saved and that there is a Savior and it's Jesus Christ. So if you're taking notes, let's look at the first one and write down counterfeit king. Counterfeit king. King Herod likes his control, his comfort, and the fact that he has no accountability. He has some accountability from Rome, but not for what he does to the people and how harsh he is to those people. He kills his own family to to keep control and to sit on the throne. And he will fight and kill anyone else who comes to supplant him from the throne. Because he likes control and comfort and no accountability. I think if we're not careful in our rebellion, that can be us. With, when presented with Jesus Christ as Lord, that turning to Christ is a, an act of submission. That it's not an add-on, but it's understanding, wait a second, I've been playing king in my life, and I'm not the one that's supposed to sit on the throne. That instantly, that confronts and conflicts with our pride. And for many of us, hearing that, that Jesus Christ, that I'm supposed to give my life to him, like he has control, that I'm supposed to read this, and if I love him, obey his commands, like that's so much that I don't want to hear. I don't want to live for him. Okay. I want to live for me. Can I just get like the Jesus patch and put it on my shirt? <laughs> and we can be like King Herod, anyone that comes against us as the ruler of our lives, as the king of our tiny little wimpy kingdom. We want to fight to the death. So if others try to tell us what to do, we fight against it, even if God himself says that he has a better way, a purpose and a plan, and that we're called to be obedient to him as we walk this thing out. We will do whatever we can to push him away, get him off of of the throne of our lives because of our pride, because of our comfort. Don't mess with my stuff. This is mine. I built this. This is me. (laughs) A little quote I put forward is, I don't want another king because I like to sit on the throne. (laughs) And so there's some of us that maybe have been in this place. I don't know about you, but... (laughs) Myself and others, I I know have wrestled through. Like, ah, I like, I hear the gospel. I like the idea of a savior, but I'm not quite sure that I like the idea of submission. I'm not quite sure that I like the idea of coming underneath and allowing God to be God in my life. And some of us, it's because of, Again, the comfort that we have, the control we have, or we don't like the idea if there's another king that means I'm accountable to someone other than just me and what I want to do. Also, it might be because of our sin, that we cling to it. And another king might say it's time for to get rid of it. And so we, we wrestle through, I, I don't want to give up this seat because if I give up this seat, you don't. We're fighting for the thing that's killing us. Wow. Wow. Instead of submitting to the one that frees us. John three sixteen through 21 says this. You've probably heard verse 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Praise God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Thank you, Jesus. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And that doesn't just mean if I've done everything good, I want to just show everybody like, look, what I've done has been before God. But it's even understanding that freedom comes from bringing those things into the light that I can even show you that even the, the wickedness I did in the past was done before the sight of God and I recognize that. That's why I'm walking in the light. That I need Jesus so that I'll have eternal life. But, but some of us maybe here today or maybe even watching this at a later date are wrestling through coming into the light because our, our, our evil and our, our deeds are evil and we want to stay in the dark. And King Herod didn't want to see light on the scene because he liked to rule and reign in the way that he did. And some of us in our own hearts, we don't have a, a, a big place that we rule over, but in our own hearts, we fight through the same struggle of wanting to sideline the king so that we can be. There's the counterfeit king. Again, how we recognize and respond. When we recognize, how do we respond? The religious disinterested, I don't even know if that's a word, disinterested, you get it though. The chief priests and the scribes, how crazy is this? They wanted the scripture but not the savior. This isn't the last time we'll see them have the right answer and not move correctly. You would think that the ones that were the Jewish people awaiting their Messiah, when they heard that it, he was on the scene and the, they knew where he was at, you would think they would have had to race the Magi to get there. Sure. Like our king is here? The anointed one, the Messiah? Hmm. But instead, they don't seem to have much interest. They don't move. And we see it constantly through Scripture. This is the first time, but not the last. That they're interested in the rules, but not the ruler. The Scripture, but not the Savior. Hmm. They're interested in their ministry and not the Messiah. The quote I have for them is, I know all about Jesus Christ, but don't feel the need to worship him. They knew about the Messiah, but didn't move to know him. The fear for, for those that grow up in the church is that they become so familiar with Jesus, but not know him. Now, that's not wrong. We want them to be familiar. Like, I want my kids to understand the Bible, but more than they know the Bible, I want them to know the author. And so we have a very high view of scripture here because it's God's word and it has authority over our life only because God has authority over our life. And so we see in these religious rulers that they, they knew the rules and not the ruler. Look at John 5, 39 through 40. They love scripture, but not the savior. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. This is Jesus. Yet you refuse to come to me and have life. Let's not be like the counterfeit king. Let's not be like those that are not interested, just religious. But we can learn 
in this even from foreign pagans probably. Yeah. Like, like these people are from afar. It's, it's not even their king as far as them being Jews as far, as far as the text goes. And all through scripture we see this regularly. Broken sinners do a better job of coming to the feet of Christ than those who should know better. And that we can learn from them in this, the wise worshiper, recognize and respond, the wise worshiper. And I need the, um, the band to come up. The magi come in humility. Here's a quote I put for them. It's revealed that Jesus Christ is king and I can't wait to worship him. That when the others, it's revealed the Messiah is there. One tries to get rid of him. The others just kind of seem disinterested. But the Magi, even though they would oftentimes be sorcerers or those that figure out riddles and, and, and confusing things, have the right understanding of who they bow before. They understand that when the Messiah is on the scene, you bow to him. That we are built to give him worship. That we are built to honor him. Built to bring him glory. And I hope that even in something as simple as looking at the wise men coming from the east to, to give, give gifts to Jesus, we could learn and deal with our hearts. That in these short 12 verses you normally hear around Christmas time, we could recognize that, man, when, when it's revealed to me who Christ is, take an assessment of how my heart is. Am I willingly wanting to come to the king? And understanding that he's built to sit on the throne, that he does sit on the throne. But am I willing to, 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 to give up the, 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 the fight over who sits in control of my life as Lord? And I love when the wise men show up, it says that they bowed down and worshiped him, which is a sign of humility. It's a sign of submission. And I can't imagine what that would have been like to voluntarily put yourself in submission before a tiny child. It takes a proper view of who that child is. They seek him, they worship him, they give great gifts to him. One of the ways that they responded to Jesus being on the scene is to honor him with gifts of resources that they had. You know, we talked about earlier, we don't, we don't talk about um, like the, the giving, tithes, offering stuff very much, but we're not afraid to talk about it. We have very sacrificial, regular givers in our church, and the reason they do that is not because we pound it from the pulpit. It's because they've had a revelation of who the king is. And it's a response of honor. Like, God, I submit everything to you. And I do not keep some things from honoring you, but every area of my life honors you. So even as I say it this morning, it's, it's not to guilt. We're called to give with, with, in, with, with a proper heart, with joy. Not out of f force. But I don't want to pretend like it's not something we do. Because it is. And it's how we've been able to continue to grow and reach people. And so I want us to learn from the wise men. It's not just that, but it's also that, that, that we would, with every area of our life, bow down. That we would, with everything, seek God, bow before him, and give him everything that we are. In a commonly used verse here, Romans 12, 
Verse 1. So fitting. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, believers, in view of God's mercy, his undeserved forgiveness, that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That we're no longer held accountable for our sins. There are, is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. In view of that mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, that does not mean to go jump on to fire somewhere. To offer our bodies, and that word body, understand, is a full embodiment of who you are. That's every aspect of who you are. As a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. True and proper worship of God is to offer everything that I have, and it only makes sense in view of his mercy. If it's in, in view of the guy telling you to do it on stage, it, that's the wrong view. It'll be too much. That's too big of an ask for me to make or anyone else to make of you. But in view of God's mercy, what God has done for us on our behalf through Christ Jesus, that Jesus, born of a virgin, living a perfect life we have not lived, perfectly righteous, Dying a brutal death on the cross, not for his sins, he never sinned, but for our sins. That as he received all of our sins on himself, he extends his righteousness to us that put our faith in him. That he died in our place, taking the punishment and wrath due our sin. Raised from the grave on the third day showing his power over sin and death, that through his resurrection, we have hope and we know of the resurrection for us. He ascended and sits on the throne alive, alive, that all those that it's been revealed to would like in this story, bow at his feet. Would you stand to your feet with me?